So if you want to see someone who has no clue what they're talking about, try to exegete John 644. We're going to get a look at that right here. This is Mike Sandpass from Toronto, Toronto Bible Study. I had decent correspondences with him uh, for a while until I learned that, you know, he's he 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 takes these verses in like, uh, I think it's First Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper, how many were asleep who didn't drink of the cup worthily. Uh, so, you know, he he thinks that God will take you out early if you sin too much. Uh, I've just got done reading comments that he says uh, we can overcome sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's he's like a lordship salvation type of teacher. He won't tell you that. He would deny it vehemently. Uh, when you say something to the effect of by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome sin. All you're saying is that the Holy Spirit helps you to keep the law. Well, this is exactly what some of the Calvinists got. Forget it. This guy hates Calvinists. This guy, all we have to do is mention predestination and God's choice. Forget it. You're a Calvinist devil. So if man can choose, and a lot of people are like this, if man can choose, it's a beautiful representation of God's love. If God chooses, he's a disgusting monster. You have destroyed his character. You have a false gospel. You're an unsaved devil. I mean, I don't even know if he said I was unsaved. I mean, the, the weird thing about these people is that you can come to them with the testimony of God's son, and then a few months down the road, they find out that you don't believe in free will, and now all of a sudden, you don't have the brotherly love anymore. They want to kick you to the curb. And I'm telling you, that I've gotten this from every single person who believes in free will and once saved, always saved. And all I have done is come to learn the knowledge that those two don't coexist. Uh, everybody wants free will until they get saved and they want God to, you know, take them away. You know, seal me with your Holy Spirit, glorify my body, do all these things that I'm totally incapable of doing. Um, but I got myself there with my own free will. God just gave grace to every human being in the world and I took advantage of it and 98 or whatever percentage of the unbelieving world is, they didn't take advantage of it. Grace is just hanging out there in the ether for everyone to take. God doesn't love anyone in particular. He's just giving grace to the entire uh, race of mankind since Adam. Even all the people that sleep now that are dead and buried that never heard the gospel, they somehow, they still had God's grace put upon them. You know, when Paul said that God called me from my mother's womb, according to his grace, you know, that's nothing personal. It's really just, that's for everyone. And for a while there, I think every Christian will believe that. But if you search the scriptures and you look at them deeply, you're going to start to see things that if you believe in free will, they don't make sense. And when you express that, forget it. All the people that used to call you brother hate you now. It's absolutely incredible. And it starts to give credence to why Christ said the world hates you, you know, and you start to wonder, you know, I know that these people say once saved, always saved. And they have the gospel. They believe in justification through faith alone, but there's this other side to them. They can't just let this free will stuff go, and they make it a big-time primary issue. It leads to a lot of condemnation that will come from them, and if you're not ready for it, you know, it could, it could bring you down. And um, I'm making this video just to expose this guy because not only do I think he's extremely unlearned and leans on his own understanding, he's going to say, this is my view or this is my opinion. You'll hear him say things like that. You'll even see how he's doing a lot of thinking. He doesn't really know what he's saying. And yet, if you get him in the comment section, I don't even want to go to the comment section and show you what he said. It's so derogatory what he says about anyone who aligns themselves with God's ability to choose God's sovereign choice. If you align yourself with that, this guy's going to let you have it, man. And so just to give you an idea, of this guy basically almost teaches what he hates. Because what, all right, so the, the, God's selection of his uh, elect is, that's one part of it. The other part of it is the progressive sanctification part, which he doesn't seem to say he wants to teach. But when I got him in the comment section, I noticed that he's, he was saying that Hebrews 10, where it says that the willful sin in Hebrews 10, that's going to be a punishment to the believer. That you should, and, and it's, it's funny because what does it say? A fire, they should expect a fiery indignation that will destroy the adversaries. 
okay? This is someone who rejects the blood of Jesus Christ and treats it as a common thing. And he thinks that that's a judgment for a believer. And this is where things between me and him went off the rails. It had absolutely nothing to do with predestination. It started with how he thinks God is going to treat people who sin. Uh, he keeps on saying that God is going to chastise you. And he uses verses from like the Lord's Supper as a, as a context for it. When God killed people, you might want to say on the spot for you know, drinking of the cup unworthily. So that's an apostolic error. That's a thing that happened over 2,000 years ago. Now, I don't think that God is killing people on the spot right now. Like you might assume they did in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I think it's chapter 11 uh, with the Lord's Supper. Uh, I don't even really think that that verse implies that. He's deriving that the, the people they came, they were alcoholics. You know, there were new people from other lands coming to the church. They come there and they see drunkards and people hogging food. And it says some of them sleep now. It doesn't say God took them home early. This is a common theme that Baptist churches even and, and other types of people like him will say, look here, you know, they went home early, man. God took them out. Great. So to be absent from the body is present from the Lord. So you're telling me my, my punishment is I go home to Jesus right now. What kind of a punishment is that? I mean, I don't even know what this guy's saying. The Bible does not say God's going to take you home early. He's going to kill you for your sin. You know, idiots like Yankee Arnold teach that garbage. And so does Mike Sandpass. If you take a look at what he's saying here. Okay. So the first sentence is not really important, but he says. Uh, so they were talking about how we can generate good, you know, whether we generate good or not. Um, and so it says, but when we believe on Christ, reading from right here, but when we believe on Christ, his righteousness is imputed onto us and the Holy Spirit will come and empower us to overcome sin. See, he just made that up. That's a lie. That's progressive sanctification. Whether he says he teaches that or not is not relevant to me because he's teaching it right here. This would mean that you're going to question your uh, own self. If you're not overcoming sins in your life, you have to look back to yourself and you have to say, well, maybe I don't have the Holy Spirit because Mike Sandpass says that he's going to impute his righteousness onto us and the Holy Spirit will come and empower us to overcome sin. So what are you doing now? You got your eyes off the crucified Christ and onto self. You're looking at yourself. You say, well, darn, I'm sinning a little too much lately. Maybe I really never had the Holy Spirit. Mike Sandpass is saying, I'm going to overcome sin. And then it says, then we do have the ability to do good and defeat sin. Well, Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. According to Mike Sandpass, Solomon's just lying. Because a just man is justified. That's why he said, there's not a just man upon the earth who doeth good and sinneth not. That's in and of our own standing. In fact, Jesus Christ said in John 5, 29, that those who do good will rise to the resurrection of life, and those who do evil will rise to damnation. Well, what's the one good thing that we can do? Believe on the Son of God. Other than that, we got nothing for him. I'm not going to offer him nothing, but my faith in his Son, that, that in itself was a gift given to me by him, right? It says in Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of judgment or to the day of Jesus Christ. John 6, 29 says that this is the work of, of God, not the work of man. This is the work of God that you believe on the one whom he has sent. So who was the one who gave us the increase when Paul preached the gospel and Apollos watered? It was God that gave the increase, right? So we know that that spark that gives us the capability and the understanding to believe comes from God. Uh, but according to this guy, he's got some kind of good in him. And if you look at this, this is 100% progressive sanctification. Don't make any mistake about it. Then we do have the ability to do good and defeat sin. Well, what does it mean to defeat sin? Because he's going to say later on, and I'm not even going to go to it because this is so ridiculous. It's not even worth going through all the comments here because people were rebuking him and I would be doing an hour long video on that alone. But I'm just going to show you here, right here. Take a look at what he's saying here. Take a look at what this liar is saying. Okay. The ability, let me highlight all of it. We 
then we do have the ability to do good and defeat sin. Okay, now he's going to try to backpedal and say, but we can still fail at this as well. So we must always be on guard. On guard for what? What are we on guard for? This guy fears sin. This guy is under condemnation himself and doesn't even know it. And he teaches it to his listeners. Thank God he has a small channel. You know, I mean, a lot of us have small channels, you know. But thank God he's got a small channel and it's not like 2,500 subs and potentially 10,000 views, you know, that are going to see this garbage. We do have the ability to do good and defeat sin. What does it mean to defeat something? It means to abolish it. It means to destroy it completely. Well, let me show you who does that for us, okay? We're going to go to the scripture and not listen to unlearned morons. Forgive me, guys, but this guy, I'm a little fired up. I'm a little fired up, not going to lie, not going to lie. Just got done reading a bunch of garbage from this guy, and you know I'm responding to it, and I might be in the flesh right now in doing so, um, but this is someone who uh, needs to be pointed out. First John chapter 3 and verse 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. I think you guys know and you're familiar with Epiaus and Apologetics. Epi and Apologetics is one of the worst devil uh, YouTube wannabe Christians out there, okay? I've made several videos on him. You can go and look back in my uh, history and just uh, type in maybe my search name or uh, and, and Epi and Apologetics. It'll come right up. So, and if not, just send me a message. I'll send you the link right away if you want to see any of the videos. These guys teach something similar, okay? They want evidence in your life that God took away your sins and they're not there anymore, meaning that he took them away. So not in a spiritual position like you're seated in the heavenlies right now, and God has removed them and they are as far as, far as from the east is to the west. Not that. They, they're, they're putting a different spin on it, like the sins are actually gone as in you don't do them. So is it the Holy Spirit that empowers us to keep the law and that's why the sins were taken away? Or is it because Christ was manifested to take away our sins by putting our faith in him and his perfect one-time sufficient sacrifice for all of our sins? Okay, That's where my faith is. That's where I look to. I don't look to myself as someone who's going to defeat sin. So you could see that this is pure heresy right there. I mean, this is, has nothing to do with predestination. We we're going to get into that. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background on what we're dealing with here. And, and here this stuff comes again. Uh, so it's going to say, but we can fail at this as, we, uh, as well, so we must always be on guard. We cannot lose our salvation, but we can lose out on eternal rewards, plural, in heaven. Guys, please go ahead and, and do your own word search in the Bible. This guy doesn't even know that it doesn't say rewards. It just says reward. Okay. Abraham was told by God, I am your great and exceeding reward. The reward is Christ. This guy thinks he's going to get a bunch of rewards for his good works that he's boasting in right here. I've preached the gospel. I volunteered at charities, etc. I just showed you multiple Bible verses showing people doing good. This guy thinks he's got some good stuff going on. He's going to boast before the Lord and he's going to expect to be given these crowns. He probably thinks that we get all five crowns or something. And so he's going to stop sinning so he can get all the crowns. He's going to do volunteer work and charity. Like the Roman Catholic Church and the LDS faith don't do that. I suppose that they're going to get crowns and rewards too. Um, and this is just, it's insanity is what it is. But anyone could start a YouTube channel. So uh, let's take a look at his exegesis of John 6 after showing you you know, I wanted to first show you that not only does he not have predestination down and he's calling all Calvinist devils and he hates them and they're all, I'm not even going to go into that because that's another hour long video of all the crash he said about any Calvinist. This guy that you're going to see here, this guy was in a debate. I think his name is, um, oh, what's his name? Bruce Ware. Uh, I mean, this guy may have some conceptions of progressive sanctification, but as you can see, Mike Sandpass does too. He's just going to say, hey, you, you know, you got to stop sinning. The Holy Spirit's going to give you the power to do it. You're going to be keeping God's law, and you're going to get all these rewards. He, that's complete garbage. That's total garbage. You, we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, guys. 
Don't let this idiot fool you and think that you got to get to work and clean the sin up out of your like life. And if you don't, God's going to either kill you, whip you, beat you, take you home early, and take all your rewards from you. This guy is an idiot. Sorry, sorry, but he's an idiot. Um, we have a security for eternity of knowing that if we truly are God's saved people, we truly have come to Christ in faith, that we will be his forever and ever. I mean, you think of Jesus in John 6, where he says, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will raise them up on the last day. He doesn't say, you know, well, you know, 90% of them will get there, but, you know, we're going to lose some in the process. No, he indicates anyone who the Father gives to him will come to him. And, of course, they can only come to him because the Father draws them. That's also in John 6. So... That's in John 6, John 6, 44. It says, no man can come to me unless the Father draws him, right? Jesus says that. No one can come to Jesus unless God draws them, the Father, okay? But what does draw mean, you know? According to, uh, according to the, what he's saying here, the way he's describing it, it means that God... What's interesting is all he did was read it. God has to basically, again, choose you, all right? This is, again, a Calvinist idea that God... Do you see this? You see, right there, what he just said is why these people are impossible to deal with. You cannot have a dialogue with them. And really, you know, I honestly think what this comes from, is it's fear-based. They are completely committed to a free will doctrine. Look, we all think we have free will, right? If you wanted to get up and go to the store and get a, 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 you know, a box of donuts from Krispy Kreme, you can go do that. We all do that, guys. We all make decisions and choices. We all do that. Okay, I'm not going to get into like, uh, is, is God present with every little thing that you do? What we're talking about is how do we understand spiritual things like the gospel? Do you believe that the gospel is something spiritual? Because I do. I believe that I was given an understanding so that I can understand that Jesus is the Christ. And I don't think that that was my work. And for that, I get called a Calvinist devil. That's, that's nuts. And so right here, he's saying this is Calvinistic. Calvinistic. He doesn't even know what he's talking about, right? And he's already just that. That's like when you just you throw that word out there that just it destroys the dialogue. You can't even have it. It's like when someone's just like, you know what, you're a racist. You know how like all these false accusations of racism came out like in the last four or five years, how like, and listen, I'm not getting into politics, but I'm saying I noticed that how you can take a word and it can destroy all dialogues. All you got to do is throw it out there and you can't unring that bell. So now that he's labeled you a Calvinist, you can't even have a dialogue because you're just a devil Calvinist. That's all you are. And so this is a man who's scared to have an honest dialogue about what the scriptures really do say. And about God's ability to choose. And see, to these people, God choosing is a monstrosity. When you choose, oh no, it's the beauty of, of God allowing you to choose. But God himself, he is, he is banned from that. He has a commandment against him and he is, no, God, you no, you're not allowed. God, no. It's like he's wagging his finger at God saying, no, no, you cannot choose God. No, you're evil God if you do that. Uh, it's, ah, this is like a fun house of insanity. God has to basically choose you, then you can have faith, and or basically make you have faith, and then when you have faith, then now, now Jesus will take you. But what it says in John 6.44, or uh, let's just look at it again, sorry. Uh What it says in John 6, 44 is, oops, not very prepared, this guy, but that's not the problem. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. But look at the next line. It is written in the prophets, and they shall, all, they shall be all taught of God. All. Thought of God, okay? 
Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So every man that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So my view, people hear and then learn about the Father. That's what that's the drawing. My view. See, the scripture doesn't matter to these people, guys. Okay. The sooner you come to the understanding that what the Bible says very, very clearly when you rightly divide the word of God, which I'm about to do as soon as we get through this, it's it's not easy listening to it, but we got to get through at least, I think, another minute or two. But when you lean on the arm of flesh, you end up with what this guy's about to say. Okay, they heard about God, and then they seek to learn more. All right, and then they come to Jesus. Okay, that's the drawing. He draws them. He just they're drawn to him. He draws them by his by his magnetic personality. They are just drawn to him. Yeah, you you heard that. You you heard that. John six forty four is talking about God's magnetic personality, guys. You just heard that from Mike Sandpass from Toronto Bible Study, a guy who teaches the Bible and rebukes Calvinists, and you know. He's doing good work. You saw, he says, I, you know, I, I do good works. I, I preach the gospel and I do charity. I do good works. I stop sinning. I, the Holy Spirit helps me keep the law. That's all. Sin is transgressing the law. He's telling you in the comment section, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to empower you to defeat sin. It wasn't Christ who destroyed the works of the devil. It was Mike Sampas. So what's interesting is you got a works righteousness slash sanctification heretic and someone who has no clue what he's talking about as far as john 6 goes i mean i've heard some bad exegesis of john 6 but i have to say this one takes the cake uh we're going to show through scripture exactly what's going on here let's first go to uh yeah let's go to john let's go to john 6 we'll start there even though there's other scriptures that we can rightly divide with john 6 that are going to help you to understand okay all right so the verses in question are going to start we're going to start right where he started okay so and let me pull up uh john 12 because it's related okay john 12 32 is related to this and so these people they have a huge problem when they try to say that this is just a general drawing Guys, you can look this up for yourself in John 6, 44, where it says, uh, draw him. That word in the Greek is heluko. And it says, draw and drag. Draw, comma, drag. It's the, actually the same Greek word used in Acts. Forgive me, I don't have the chapter and verse memorized. If anyone wants to know, I can put a link. I can put it in the description. Um it's the same Greek word when Paul was dragged off to prison. He was hauled off to prison. Same Greek word. Guys, Jesus Christ came to seek and to find what was lost. Okay? You were his sheep before the foundation of the world. When God has foreknowledge of you, it's not that he's looking through a crystal ball and he saw that you made the right decision. He knows you because he loves you with a salvific, unique love according to his purpose his will and his grace and that is absolutely awesome and people like this want to take it away and then call you a devil for believing it and i am sick and i am tired of hearing it okay and it's out of sheer stupidity that's all it's from maybe anger too and i'm not saying i didn't get angry i'm not, I'm not trying to say that but i do believe that it's my anger is placed in someone just doing something stupid, not being learned in the scripture, not taking the time to study, and then accusing me the same exact thing. So projecting his problem onto me. Um, so no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And notice what, what, what Jesus says here. He says, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now. This is in a salvific sense. This is not 
some raised to damnation, some raised to life. This context, and I will show you, is raised to life. We don't want to think that Jesus Christ is saying, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day, but, that, but he might be going to hell. I don't think any of us believe that, right? We could all collectively agree that right here is salvation. I will raise him up at the last day. And all we got to do is go back and take a look at verse 40. John 6, 40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. There's context. We got everlasting life, okay, guys? We got everlasting life. All right, let's not forget that. But back to this, this has got to be done. So what he's saying is that the father is so magnetic that he just draws. Ooh, you know, he's drawing you to him. Wow, this guy's right. This guy, God, he's got a great personality. I mean, this guy, he's just the whole point of this just went right over his head. So we got John 12, 32. So here's the problem that people have with John 6, 44 and John 12, 32. John 12, 32 says, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So a lot of people say, look, he's going to draw all men. That's all. That means every single man born since Adam, he's going to draw them all to him. Well, he had to be lifted up first. What does that mean? He had to go to the cross. So everybody before that couldn't have gotten drawn. That's why you see in Ephesians chapter 2 uh, that the, the people that were in the Gentile nations were without the covenants. They were without the promises. They were without God. They were without hope in the world. Now, now look at them. The gospel went out to the nations. Jesus Christ said, if I be lifted up from the earth, meaning put up on the cross, glorified, right? He's now going to draw all men from every tongue, tribe, kindred, and nation all around the world. And we see that in reality. What we don't see in reality is every single person being drawn to Jesus Christ. Okay? That's why there's 2.1 billion Muslims in the world. Another one point something billion Roman Catholics, not saying they're all unsaved. We just know that the vast majority of them have a gospel-less or Christless gospel. Um, you have multiple denominations that have a Christless gospel, LDS, Mormonism, you know, uh, Jehovah Witness, stuff like this. But then you got a billion or two billion atheists out there that are just completely they, they make fun of God, call him Sky Daddy, tell people they're stupid and ridiculous for worshiping. Um, and so... Clearly, they're not all being drawn because the father doesn't draw you and he's just not capable of bringing him to you. That's not what this is saying. No, it's clearly stating here. No man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. We've already shown through context that it's a salvific raising up and I will raise him up the last day. May have everlasting life, right? We know that. So if you look at John 12, and you see how it says, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The all are the ones who were given, as it says right here, all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. So we don't come to him until we're given and drawn. Two acts by God. We're given, we're drawn, and then we come. Coming is believing. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Okay? So we know that coming is believing. Well, what happens first? This is chronological order here. We don't need to be rocket scientists to see this. All that the Father giveth me, so you're given, shall come to me. And it's all. It's not some. Do we see everyone coming to Jesus? No. That's a reality that is observable. You could see that not everyone is coming to Jesus. So it's not that Jesus is going to try to draw you or the Father is going to try to draw you to the Son, and he's just going to miss 90% of the time, you know? He's just going to shoot and miss. And, you know, these people are going to hear the gospel, and, and they're just they're not going to believe it because that's their fault. Well, Paul said, I planted Apollos water, but God giveth the increase. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God giveth the increase. God causes the growth. Well, what does that mean? The seed falls on hard ground. It was never capable of believing to begin with. It was never capable of taking the seed in and believing it. So we have something that is clear cut. I've shown you in scripture. 
his exegesis of this verse is probably the worst I've seen. Uh, it's a made up fairy tale that God has a magnetic personality and that's how he woos you unto him. No, God is going to save exactly every single person he intended to save. Okay. We were called with an holy calling, not according to works. Okay. And so there's nothing inherently good about you that you have the capability to believe the gospel and the person standing next to you doesn't. None seeketh after wisdom, none seeketh after God. There are no, uh, no one righteous, no, not one. There's no one righteous, no, not one. There's also no one that seeketh after God. Apply that same hermeneutic because if you don't, then you have to say, well, there's some righteous, you know, because if, if there's some that seeketh after God, well, then there's also some righteous, right? Right there in the previous verse in Romans 3, 10 and 11. There is no one righteous, no, not one. None seeketh after God, none seeketh after wisdom. Okay, well, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything will be added unto you. That's uh, Matthew 6, 33. So here Jesus is telling you to seek God, and here's Paul in Romans 3 saying, none seek after God. Well, well how do we reconcile that? It's not a contradiction. What that means is that nothing's going to happen until God makes the move. Jesus has come to seek what he has lost. You know, you are loved with a salvific love. These people don't believe that. They believe that God just has this plain general love for every single person in the world. And God does have mercy on humanity. They're not getting killed on the spot as they were under the law 4,000 years ago. So there is a mercy under humanity right now. Okay. You could say there's a kindness that God has shown towards humanity. And he's not just utterly destroying people you know, uh, by the hundreds of thousand. Well, unless you want to look at like, uh, you know, COVID-19 and things like that, disease and famine, you, you could say that that's the work of God. But we also know that many believers have probably suffered those deaths. So, you know, do, do you want to start getting into the nuance of saying, well, God is chastening those people. He gave them COVID and killed them. You know, I'm sure many, many Christian believers died of COVID. And so we're going to say God was punishing them or something. Well, maybe Mike Sampas will say that was sinning too much and God took him out early. So you never know what you're going to get. But we could see that people are not being destroyed for erecting golden calves and molten idols and things of that nature, right? So we even have Satanism. Like, did you see that thing in Arkansas a few years ago? And like, I think it was like 2015 or something where they a crane came and dropped, dropped a giant Baphomet right at the front stoop of like a a court in in arkansas i was like wow that was a wake-up call for me when i saw that i don't i wasn't even a believer back then um but yeah so you see that there's a general kindness towards uh, mankind uh since the law um and the prophets uh was you know the law and prophets were until john like luke 16 16 says and so it, and now that the faith has come you know the, the law is not in effect there's no levitical priesthood there's none of that um, but the law will be used to judge the unbelieving and the wicked. So, you know, it does exist in that sense. Um, but we'll just take a look at what Jesus says himself. John 14, 17, he says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him for he dwelleth in you or dwelleth with you and shall be in you. OK, so he's talking to disciples here and the spirit. See, he hasn't been crucified yet, Christ. He's still speaking to the disciples. So this is incredible stuff here. Notice how he says, for he dwelleth with you. So he's talking about himself. That's how I see that. Now, you know, I don't. this, this is not a point of contention. You could say that the spirit was in the midst of them. He did pour the spirit out on them, but that was after he was resurrected. But it says, and shall be in you. So that hadn't happened yet. But he's saying the world cannot receive it, guys. So that's that is very important to understand. Because Jesus also said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, you have to understand that there's an unbelieving world that Christ already knows they can't receive it. Okay, And if we take a look at John 12, we'll see why they can't receive it. And it's right here. The saying of Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath received our report. And to him, oh, I'm sorry, and to whom? Had the arm of the Lord been revealed, therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal him. 
heal them. That's salvation. Okay, that's salvation. This has nothing to do with you. Salvation is the 100% work of God. Okay, that's why we boast in Christ Jesus. Okay, we don't boast in anything that we do. Who would want to? Who would want to? Who would want to boast about anything that's in the flesh? We boast in Christ Jesus and worship in the spirit. First Corinthians uh, 1 shows that, you know, God has chosen or foresee your calling, brethren. Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea. How many times does God have to say he chose? Okay. Another example is where in, in John uh, 15, you see, God's not allowed to choose according to these people because then you're, you know, God would just be a Calvinistic God. You see, he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whosoever, that whatsoever you shall ask of my father, in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So he says, well, Jesus is only talking to disciples here. Yeah, he's not talking to you. He's not talking to regular believers, whatever that means. You're just a regular old believer. Imagine that. Could you imagine? That? You're just, you're just, you're not, you know, you don't have the same love. God doesn't, you know, he doesn't speak to you the same way. Uh, it says right here in verse 19, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Well, guess what, guys? A lot of people hate Christianity. They don't just hate the disciples. Okay, These verses are not exclusively for the disciples because John chapter 14 all the way to 17, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is Jesus talking strictly to the disciples there. And what are we to believe that we should just, well, this stuff is not really for us. Let's just, you know, we could read it and stuff for record purposes, but it's not really got nothing to do with us. Yeah, I don't want to do that because there's some beautiful stuff in here. And I know that God is not just speaking about the disciples through his son here. Um, and so there's some other things here. Uh, it says, he that hateth me hateth my father also. And so you, you have to understand that he's telling them what's going to happen after he goes. He says, but when the comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the father, he shall testify of me. Do, do you want to believe that the spirit of truth is in you? That the father sent that to you? And that you get that through Jesus Christ? Of course you want to believe that. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant not or knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. I guess that doesn't apply to us. These things that I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And First John reiterates that. I write these things unto you, that your joy might be full. I guess that's that's only to the disciples, right? How many other verses do we have to pull out of here because this was only to the disciples? That's the kind of lunacy that you have to get to to believe what this guy's teaching about the scriptures. And I just want to close with John 17. This is the prayer. And he's going to say beautiful things here. Okay, and it says, I and them and thou and me. This is John 17, 23 that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And then he talks about the other sheep. Uh, Father, I, oh, that's John 10, I'm sorry. But just John 17, 24, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me. Okay, these are us. Th guys, This is <laughs> this is about you. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, this is about you. Don't let this guy, Mike, tell you, oh, this is, you know, this choosing stuff, that's just for the 11 disciples. Oh, and just all the prophets, you know. Oh, and just Paul and, you know, these guys were chosen, but we're not. 
You know, we're just these regular people fighting for our salvation out here in the world, self-righteously attaining to it with our capabilities, our, with our natural capabilities. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, but with me where I am, that they, uh, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Guys, God knew you before the foundation of the world. He didn't just have a crystal ball of foreknowledge where he looked down the corridors of time and saw that you would choose him, and so then he chose you. The Bible doesn't say that God saw that you would believe, and then he chose you. It just says he chose you. Okay? Three times in 1 Corinthians, and that's not the only time. Okay? Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians. And I already know I didn't cover even a fraction of these verses, man. There's just so many of them, I don't even know where to go sometimes. No, I think it's one, yeah. Okay. So, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And so that doesn't mean that we elected God. <laughs> it means it's it's God's election of you is what that means. That's basically what that means. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as we know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Okay, so guys, the gospel doesn't just come to you in mere words. It comes in power and conviction of the Holy Ghost. Okay. That's not something that's just a general thing that's just casted out to every person. Anyone who's moved and given understanding by the Holy Spirit becomes a believer. That person was chosen before the foundation and world of the world, just like it says in Ephesians 1. Okay? You know, what they like to do in Ephesians 1 is say, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto adoption of children, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Where do you see your will playing a role in there? If you see your will and your choice in these scriptures, you're adding it in there. You're adding it in there because it doesn't say that. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that we chose God. Okay? And ultimately, you do choose God. But why do you choose him? Because the Father drew you. The Father had given you to the Son. And the Son revealed him to you, as it says in Matthew eleven twenty seven. You know, this is a verse I would like to finally see someone do an exegesis of. You have all these people calling us heretics, Calvinists, devils. Why don't you just get on there and do a video on Matthew eleven twenty seven alone and, and just tell me what this verse really means because, you know, I mean, shoot, we know that we know God, right? I mean, if you're born of God, do you know him? Does he know you? Yes. Jesus said, uh, my sheep know me. Uh, my sheep follow me and I know them. And I give, them, I give unto them eternal life. And he also says that they know me because they hear his voice. So right here, he says, all things are delivered unto me of my father, and no man knoweth the son but the father, neither knoweth any man the father save the son, and he to whomsoever the son will reveal him. So they do the same works, the father and the son. All things are delivered unto me of my father. Remember John 6, 37, all that my father hath given to me will come to me. And he who comes to me, I will no wise cast out. John 6, 39. Forgive me, but I'll post the verses in uh, uh, the edit. But yeah, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And then look who else gets to know the Father and the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now what they're going to say to support their free will choice doctrine is they're just going to say, well, yeah, those people that the Son revealed were the ones who believed. We know from John 6 that's not the order of things. That will always be added because it's not in the Scripture. 
Okay, so I know this was like a <laughs> I was heated about this, but uh, I I don't know if anyone um, sees things the way Mike does. Uh, I don't think Mike is going to make it through this whole video. I don't expect that. But I just want to show you because he already made like this idle threat because he likes to he he likes to fancy himself as someone who exposes false teachers when he himself is one. And so he said in one of his comments that me and Chris Truth Speller were next on his list. So I guess you can call this a preemptive strike. And if, if anyone was able to get some edification out of this and, you know, they, they want to take a shot at Matthew 1127 here or. Another couple verses you might want to take a look at is Mark 4, 11 through 12, and you'll see that it's God that gives the understanding to people. All right. You know, in 1 John 5, 20, it says God has given us an understanding so that we may know him who is true um, and be in him who is true, I think it says. Yeah. So all that has to do with salvation. And yeah, we, we understand these things because God gave us understanding and we believe the gospel because the Holy Spirit moved on us and, and gave us that increase and that ability to believe it's not something you just self-righteously attain to so hopefully this blesses someone take care guys good night